Good morning. I'm Sharon Burke, and I am the director of the Resource Security Program at New America. Uh, this is a great event we're going to have this morning, so we're delighted you could join us. So climate security as a concept has been around for a long time. In fact, I have a report that I just pulled off the shelf this morning from the German Advisory Council on Global Change from 2007. That's climate change as a security risk. So people have been thinking about this for a long time, but moving from concept to practice, the policy, the field work, the investments, that's not been quite as fast when it comes to climate security. So today the US government is starting to make up for lost time. And I wanted to pull together this group we have with us today to help set the stage for my own government. Um, I've had multiple conversations with key actors in the Biden administration and in the executive branch and also on, uh, in our legislature uh, about this topic. And we do plan to follow up with some smaller, more focused roundtables um, after this great scene setting conversation today. So what you have here today are some of the top thinkers and practitioners on climate security in the world. So what a gift that is for us, but it does mean two things. I'm not gonna go through all of the bios for these people, and this is a very distinguished group. So please, please look at our event page and make sure that you can see the background of these people and why you should really trust what they have to tell you. They've, they've come by this through a lot of hard work. Uh, we will also be posting key documents from these folks. So you'll be able to find some really interesting links there. And, and also I'm gonna be heavily facilitating this conversation so that we can move through the, uh, the topics we wanna cover. And I've asked all of my speakers to limit their remarks to three minutes, three minutes. I know that's incredibly short. Three minutes is hard to do, but we're gonna aim for that partly so we can get some crosstalk and that we can get through a lot of, of subjects. They all have so much more to say than that, but we do hope to have follow on discussions, as I said. So to our panelists, I thank you all for your scholarship, your work and your help with this conversation today. So I'd like to start with a lightning round. So a lightning round means we're gonna go around very, very fast, quick, 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 and get comments from people, just a few seconds if you can. So I scoured the literature in the last couple of days for a working definition of climate security, which was um, a surprisingly diffuse challenge, uh, which maybe we can all talk about some more. But just from a recent report, I picked this one. Um, climate change is a threat multiplier, exacerbating existing risks to security. So quick, quick, I'm gonna ask you, what do you think of that? Does that definition work for you? Uh, let's start with Janani Vivekananda with Adelphi in Berlin. Do you agree with that definition, Janani? Thanks so much, Sharon. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, well, I don't want to get tied up in semantics with the kind of threat versus risk. I think there was a lot of value in that definition. It was helpful at the time when it came out around 2007, when the main challenge was to get people to see and accept this link between climate and security. But we're past that now. And I think understanding has evolved and so too must our language. I think we really need to evolve the language to keep a pace with the need. The need now is to answer the so what question. I think people are at this point, policymakers are at this point of, yes, we accept it, we get it, finally. Um, now, so what? What do we do about it? And I don't think this term helps us with that. I think we need to go beyond this to something more um, action oriented, something more solution oriented to tell us what to do about these risks, uh, how to do better assessment, what, uh, what the kind of dimensions of resilience are, something uh, that actually tells us how to answer the so what question. Okay, um, and we'll get into that in our discussion. Louise Van Schaik at the Klingendale Institute in The Hague um, so does that definition work for you? And it's okay to say, no, it doesn't. I have a much richer one and I will, you know, we will post it. Yeah. Yeah. We just made a definition of climate security practices. So on the ground action to address this agenda. But I think what the threat multiplier uh, under, um, uh, uh, does not recognize enough is that climate change through its impacts on extreme weather events can also serve as a direct threat. And the other aspect of climate security, which is not included, is um, how security actors in the military need also to deal with climate impacts directly for their organization and how they contribute uh, to the causes of climate change. So that are, for instance, elements that, that would need also to be explored in a broader climate security agenda that goes beyond the threat multiplier concept. 
Thank you, Luis. Um, Benedetta Berti Alberti, who is the Chief of Policy Planning with NATO in Brussels. Um, do you all have a working definition yet for climate security that you're using? We are we're working on it, and uh, and the previous two speakers here I think have made uh, my life substantially easier because I fundamentally agree with both points. I, I agree that actually that definition is being uh, godsend, if you wish, in terms of advancing the policy discussion. But we have done so. I think we are in a different stage. It's a good it's a good stage to me because there is a much stronger political. A momentum that recognizes uh, climate change as a global transboundary, uh, I would say, uh, cross, uh, cross, uh, cross, cross uh, society type of, of threat. And I think that we need to expand a little bit the boundaries beyond just the indirect threat multiplier language. Uh, but I think the discussion is going in that direction. And then I would agree with Janani on the importance of actually uh, talking about the so what and the very simple so what that we have at NATO is, is that therefore, being that this is one of the defining, if not the defining challenge of our time, every, every component of society has a role to play and must play a role in adapting, responding and mitigating and combating climate change. So I think that second part of the definition will be helpful. Okay, good. Um... Elliot Levine from Mercy Corps, who's joining us very early in the morning in Portland, Oregon. Do you guys have a working definition for climate security? Um, we, we, we have not developed our own formal working definition. We've worked off of ones similar to the ones that, that you just mentioned, Sharon. And as you know, there's a variety of these, these out there. I think um, I don't really have anything too much more innovative to say of, uh, in, to build on anything that what Jeanne and Luis already rightly said. I think the threat multiplier language was was helpful for us in the beginning when sort of communicating this to sort of agency wide for, for us um, and with our partners. Um, but it really doesn't speak to what we found, do doesn't speak to the direct impacts that climate change can have on security risks. And you know, as an agency that focuses on implementation, it really doesn't speak much at all to about the actions that can be taken to address those risks. So yeah, those would be the two Thanks, things. Elliot. Florian, you've done a ton of writing on this, and I'm curious in particular what you think about the threat multiplier framing, but, but also if you have a working definition that, that works for policy, please feel free to share it. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I put it in the chat, um, at least one of the working definitions we are using oh, was still in- Florian, let, ah. excuse me, just briefly to say, this is Florian Krampe, who is with CIPRI in Stockholm, an amazing organization. Sorry about that, Florian, please go ahead. No worries, thank you so much. Um, great to be here. I maybe want to go into the semantic that, that Janani was, was uh, um, uh, referring to. I think um, the, the, it, it's first of all great to see um, the climate security framing uh, on, on focused on risks that we have been pushing for a couple of years is catching on. And is, uh, I think that's the biggest change we have seen in the last couple of years and progress um, because the language we use and the way we frame it and define it is important. Um, the threat multiplier, as, as was said already, gets everyone excited, but it doesn't tell us what to do. And if we're moving into the space where we want to do something, framing it differently, putting risks up front is really important because it is more inclusive. It puts human security at the center and it puts um, adaptation and, and sort of it, it finds the intervening spaces, which are, are development centered instead of um, hard security centered. Okay, and that is a really important point, Florian, and we're going to come back to it for sure. Um, that question about hard security versus human security. Um, and then let's get to Catherine Wong, who is with the United Nations in New York City. Um, Catherine, do you all have a working definition? You have so much influence over this field by virtue of where you sit. You know, does, does the UN have a working definition of climate security? Thanks so much, Sean. And I think. Um... This is still um, a, new, a new space for many, and we're all learning and taking um, direction and, and trying to um, understand the lay of the land, so to speak. And I think the panelists have really, the other panelists have really covered um, a lot in terms of the threat multiplier versus the risk multiplier um, narrative. I would just note, probably from um, from from our, our perspective, I guess um, a lot of the different definitions hold true. 
um, human security, uh, freedom from, from fear and freedom from want. Um, national security is also referenced um, by member states, in, including in the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. Um, climate um, change and its um, effects on um, peace, stability and security are also a matter of international peace and security. And so the, the definitions all have um, relevance, some more than others, depending on context. Uh, when we're talking about direct impacts, and for example, if you're considering the Pacific small island developing states, um, existential security um, is, uh, is, is, is important. And um, I think, you know, we understand that the definitions are not mutually um, e exclusive, and it's about perhaps the, you know, the operational definitions, de definitions which work on the ground, and which serve a purpose, um, and kind of tie into the top line guidance that, you know, we might hope to be able to, um, to distill and to provide and being able to connect to um, the, the, the narratives and, and framing, as, as Florian mentioned just now, of, the, of our partners on the ground that we're working with. And, you know, we understand fully as well that some narratives um, have a legacy that can be sensitive and even more so um, in conflict affected and fragile contexts. And, you know, we can have that conversation with partners and get to a common understanding when we feel like we're speaking the same language. That's great. And that, and one of the reasons I wanted to start this way, um, and, you know, you all of you referred to this is that the, some of the questions I got in advance from Biden administration officials was just this question about lexicon and framing and how do we actually frame um, at this juncture. So that's why I wanted to start this way. Uh, we also got a lot of questions from, especially from the Department of Defense, you know, they've gotten direction from the president and from the Secretary of Defense um, to move out on a climate risk analysis and on um, other important steps but actually taking those steps and what they should look like and how you actually do this, they're still trying to figure that out. They're still, they have a lot of questions in that space. Now, of course, DOD is not the only US agency involved. Um, as everybody here knows, it's, that's certainly true for um, all the countries represented here. Um, so I asked if Daniel Abrahams from the US Agency for International Development could just jump in here in the beginning, just to give us a short comment about how his agency is looking at climate security and climate change, because they're actively trying to figure this out right now. Daniel, could you just say a few words to us to get us you know, framed on the how US is looking at this? Yeah, sure. And let me let me start with a really important point that, that my comments don't reflect a formal USA position, but but instead my observations as a AAAS fellow on how the agency is, is thinking about and considering. Uh, climate security topics, and I, I've been at USAID for just under a year. Understood. Um, and and I do see a few key trends, um, and I think all of these observations that I'm about to make, I, I don't think they're specific to the agency. I, th I think they they reflect patterns for the field at large. So first, um, th there is definitely momentum on and interest in climate security, and and of course climate change more generally. And that interest goes well beyond narrowly defined climate change mitigation or adaptation programs, but, but includes the myriad ways that climate change filters through the agency's work. And conflict mitigation and prevention is, is no exception to that. Um, and there's enormous diversity in how that thinking has come, come about from highly localized questions about climate change and gender-based violence to the potential for environmental peace building to mitigate cross-border conflicts. And, and I think these efforts and this breadth of thinking underscores not simply that there's energy, but also that there is not a generalizable model for USAID or I would think any US governmental agency and how they approach climate change and, and security. I think my second point would be that the, the increasingly nuanced academic research that many of the panelists referenced in, in, in regards to the threat multiplier language, and I think is very well reflected in Florian's work, um, that's understood at the agency. There, there's, there's, there's widespread appreciation that climate change is not a causal driver of conflict, but a, a contextual threat that depends on specific climate impacts and local systems and local institutions and, and sort of broader political economies that uh, affect both structural and, and direct violence. Uh, I think the third point, and, and I know Elliot will appreciate this, is that there are very real barriers to effectively developing and implementing and evaluating climate security programming from a development perspective. So for example, more than half of the countries where USAID operates suffers from either armed conflict or, or some other form of, of widespread violence. 
And, and somewhat paradoxically, that makes it far more challenging, but far more important um, due to the unique vulnerabilities to climate change brought about um, by conflict. And I, and I think sort of my final thought is, as, as a field, that is the pl plateau that we're in. And Sharon, you referenced that earlier. We, we, our understanding of climate security is more sophisticated than it has ever been, but our ability to operationalize that sophistication faces any number of barriers. And for me, that raises a number of questions. Um, for example, how, how do we overcome the barriers that challenge program design and implementation? How do we appropriately draw out generalizable lessons that account for the different contexts that define climate security? And how do we consider an individual's role in a community and how that might affect our human security? And I raise these difficult questions, but, but want to emphasize that they're not rhetorical. They are sort of central to getting work done, to getting development work done that, that centers on environmental security, that leverages environmental peace building and, and conflict sensitive adaptation that, that considers climate change and conflict not separate, but as sort of compounding stress, stressors. Um, and I'm very excited to hear from the panel and to, to hear from you, Sharon, too, on these topics, because I, I, as, as you mentioned, I think this is really a world class group of thinkers and, and we'll have important insights onto these topics and I'll turn it back to you now. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. That was a great way to get started. And, and while you are speaking uh, for yourself right now, I do wanna point out that this is more than just an academic question, Daniel, because he's gonna be jumping into the portfolio. So he's gonna have to actually do this and answer his own questions, which was one of the reasons I thought it'd be great to have him here today. And Daniel, just an open offer, as we go through this conversation, feel free to jump in if you have a question or, or a comment that you wanna add. Um, I'm not gonna call on you by name, um, but you are you have a carte blanche to jump in anytime you want, okay? Thank you, will do. Okay, and thank you. Okay, so AIDs trying to figure those things out. They're actually actively working on a climate strategy that I believe is due by August. Um, the Department of Defense is working on a climate risk analysis that is supposed to inform their strategy and all kinds of other activities there. Um, so a really important good starting point is what does good look like when it comes to analysis and decision support tools? And I wanted to start by asking Janani to, to, to discuss with us the weathering risk project that Adelphi and the German government have engaged in with partners. Janani, can you tell us a little bit about that project and that as a sort of uh, risk analysis and decision support um, effort? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Sharon. If um, if I'm allowed, I'll just share a couple of slides with you. I mean, it's not a bombardment, I hope. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm delighted to have this chance to tell you a bit about weathering risk, uh, the global climate security risk and foresight assessment. So this initiative, it, it came out of the seminal G7 report, A New Climate for Peace. Um, and one of the main recommendations of this 2015 study, which incidentally, uh, USG, State Department and aid were very much involved in was the need for a global climate security risk assessment. People could see that climate security risks were important, important not just to climate and environment, but to foreign policy, to the G7 foreign ministers, but uh, they needed to know more about what these risks look and feel uh, like on the ground to actually be able to respond to them. And so weathering risk was commissioned. It was launched under the Berlin Quarter Action last summer by the German foreign minister. And it's a multilateral and multidisciplinary affair. Here you can see some of the excellent partners that we're lucky enough to work with. It's led by Adelphi and the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And I have to say that having been lucky enough to have been a co-author of the G7 study back then and now leading this work on weathering risk, it's really great to see this, this kind of follow through from that initial analysis to these recommendations, seeing them coming to life with such uh, a broad raft of support, this kind of burgeoning community of practice. And I think that's really important. So it's, seeing, it, it's not just this one-off uh, flash in the pan, there really is, is, is some continuity here. Uh, next slide, thank you. So, um, so what, what are we actually doing? So the, the, the initiative, it's got three goals, uh, risk-informed planning, uh, enhancing capacity for action and improving operational responses. Essentially, our objective with this initiative is to develop something that can actually be used to affect change on the ground to address the risks that climate 
climate change is posing to peace and security to help us move from the talk to the walk. So the first step is better assessment to ensure that local, national, international uh, strategies, policies, and just general decision making across the three Ds have access to and thus can be better informed by evidence-based analysis on climate security risks. So this initiative seeks to improve our knowledge of how climate impacts interact with conflict risks in specific contexts and importantly what concrete actions we can actually be taking to prevent or reduce these risks so next slide thank you so the methodology uh, has five steps this is how we intend to go about this first we look at climate impacts at uh, the subnational level um, we can go quite downscale. There's really good climate data available. Um, and here we're lucky enough to have a, a great uh, partnership with PIC, the Potsdam Institute for Climate, to get the best available climate impact data. Then we look at the context. And this is, again, best done at the most granular level. And this part is qualitative um, and importantly looks at how these different risks interact with different identity groups, with men, women, elderly, disabled, different religious groups, uh, different livelihood groups, etc., in different ways, so that we can understand these, these relationships, these power dynamics, these different resilience factors, uh, which might compound or mediate these risks. So an intersectional approach is really fundamental to how we understand risk and thus inform the right kind of responses that are not one size fits all. Now, climate is, of course, part of the context. So we then look at how climate interacts with these existing contextual risks uh, using an analytical framework. The framework we use builds on the best of what's already out there. It's not new, uh, but I think that's a good thing. Uh, we didn't see the need or the value of creating something new when there's so much that's really good out there that already works. So we took the best bits of what's out there and we can splice them together. And I'll share this with you in a sec. The third step is about looking forward uh, to ensure that we're not just using historical data to inform our analysis, because we can see now that really the future looks so different to the past, we can't, we can't be using historical data alone to, to help us make decisions about the future. So we'll be developing context specific scenario and foresight exercises. Uh, including some great work with Sharon to develop a game um, to help with this kind of forward forward planning. Uh, the fourth step is machine learning, They're bringing in a kind of uh, a step to test the assumptions that's, uh, and validate the, the, the pathways that we're identifying through this essentially very qualitative approach um, to kind of um, just check that there, there aren't any trends that are, be, are being missed through kind of um, qualitative uh, subjective biases. And then the final step, and perhaps the most important one, is to use this analysis to then identify appropriate responses, uh, context specific measures to actually address these, these risks. Uh, and then the next slide, thank you. So here's the analytical framework. Um, there's a lot to go into, I won't go into too much uh, detail, but essentially we have a climate lens to look at the climate impacts. That's the first circle. Uh, if you just click again, thanks. Uh, then we've got the peace and security lens to look at the economic, social, political stability, as well as the existing and past drivers of uh, insecurity. Uh, click one more time. Then the uh, we analyze these interactions through different kind of pathways. These are prototypes. They're not straight jackets, but they're a starting point to start to understand um, how these uh, these risks play out in specific contexts. Some will be more, more important than others. And then one more click. Oh, it's not. Yeah, there we go. And finally, we'll look at uh, contextual factors shaping not just vulnerability, but also resilience to climate and conflict risks, including gender equality, social inclusion, these kind of factors. So this approach, it not just looks at risk, but also dimensions of resilience so that we really can use this analysis to identify the right kind of responses that answer the so what question. Um, it's openly accessible, it's scalable, free to use and uh, replicable. And we've just finalized our methodology and it will be launched later this month, but I'd be really happy to share it with anyone interested in seeing it before then. And it's very early in the project, but we'll be piloting it, um, piloting this approach with our partners, with Catherine's colleagues, the UNDP and UN Environment in Mali, uh, to test it out in actual kind of real world context and also testing it on kind of sectors to stress test um, or be first to be testing it with the food system uh, with, with the World Food Programme in Sudan to see how we can use this kind of approach to also look at kind of um, testing uh, sectoral portfolios to see whether they're climate security risk proof and how perhaps within these portfolios there is actually resilience building capacity as well that we can pick up through this kind of an assessment approach. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.
That's great. Uh, nicely done. And you you answered a couple of questions I had for you in the course of your comments, uh, including who do you see as, as natural users, but you already have the user tests in, integrated in. And Benedetta, can I ask you, does NATO have a climate risk analysis uh, process or is, is one underway? Are you working on something? Thanks, Sharon. And I'll try to stick to the three minutes because because um, indeed we are doing quite a bit of work on this. And most recently, uh, as of March, as of March of this year, we have an agreed climate and security agenda uh, that basically sets the direction of travel for NATO and the 30 NATO allies when it comes to uh, to understanding the role that we should play uh, when it comes to climate change and security. So it's already a very solid, I would say, policy base as common, uh, I would say the building blocks of a common strategy. And we are also hoping to, we are developing this further and at our summit uh, just a few weeks away in June, we're going to, to, to announce additional decisions that pretty much build on this initial climate change and security agenda. Uh, what do we do with the, with this incredibly complex topic? We are boiling down to three main areas where NATO as an organization need to step up what it does. One is situational awareness and understanding of the risks and impact of climate change. The second, uh, the second area is adaptation. So what do we need to do both as an organization and as our allied armed forces in order to um, to reconfigure, to adapt, to evolve, to, to meet the demands of a changing climate. And third, there is a mitigation, uh, there is a mitigation uh, set of uh, interventions that really focus on what is the impact, what, looking at our organization and our armed forces also as, uh, as having to play a role when it comes to combating and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for, for three minutes, I will just focus on the first point because you asked me about the, the situational awareness. And I think here there is, the, the long story short is that, there is when you start to think about the 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 need for situational awareness of how climate change impacts our security, then it's very clear that there's a series of uh, there's a series of questions that we need to and we are answering. One is how does climate change impact on our deployments, our missions, on our operations? So that's where what NATO would call our out of area, um, our outer area involvement. Second, how does climate change impact uh, our roles and our deployments in the Euro-Atlantic area? And here it's really about uh, looking at the climate resilience of our military installations, bases, identifying climate vulnerabilities and thinking about how do we boost our climate resilience in area. Then there's, of course, a, a second layer of analysis that is more region regional, region-specific, context-specific. It looks at how climate change can uh, contribute to exacerbate uh, situational state fragility, in exacerbate situations of conflict. So it's more about, uh, about uh, the, the strategic impact, if you wish, of climate change on the broader context. And then we also look at the role of climate change in the role that climate change plays on broader geopolitical dynamics and on broader dynamics of geopolitical competition. So that's both uh, cross-cutting uh, as a cross-cutting theme it has to do with, uh, with I would say, both our immediate neighborhood, but also the broader, uh, the broader, the broader threat assessment that we have as an alliance. And then I, for three minutes, again, I cannot give all the examples, but what I'm trying to get at is that once, it, once you take this seriously, and we must, and we are, then, then analyzing and having robust situational awareness of our, on, on how climate affects security needs to be cross-cutting from the operational level to the to the tactical level. So how do we equip our soldiers to withstand weather that are hotter, wilder, windier, more unpredictable? To the more strategic, how do we reconfigure our, our understanding of conflict itself? And how do we foresee uh, the fact that our militaries and how well we use our militaries will also be affected by climate change? For example, the simple fact that more extreme and frequent uh, weather events will, will 
most possibly lead to our increased frequency of natural disasters on our homelands will put increased strain on our civil preparedness system, in turn putting more pressure on our militaries to also step in. So there is it, it really the point I'm making is that it, it goes from the operational to the strategic at all levels. And the role that we think we can play, and we're trying to play as much as possible as an alliance, is that we can be a uh, really important platform to exchange best practices, to share data, and to create a cross cutting analysis that really looks not just at our individual allies, but also at the whole of the alliance, because ultimately that's really, really important to our ability to fulfill our mission. And that's, I think, a point. That we're making uh, that we're making very clearly to um, to our military colleagues, and they were, and they are very much uh, receptive to it. That uh, unless we take this seriously, and unless we really mainstream it, and then adapt the way we do training, the way we do exercising, the way we do military planning itself, we will not in the future be able to be as effective operationally. So it's not a trade-off between taking climate, there is no, it's a false trade-off, the one between hard security and, and understanding climate risk. I would say there is no effective uh, future-proof uh, defense strategy if it doesn't really take climate seriously. And I'll stop here. That's quite a statement. Um, so, um, and I, but I think, I think it's very positive uh, thing that NATO is taking this on and that NATO's role in understanding the risk and characterizing the risk in a way that's very tangible, that can be consumed in strategy planning and policy sure. um, and investments. It's a good time where I also make my, sorry, my disclaiming statement that of course I'm not, ex I'm, I am speaking as Benedetta and this is, a, and I think that's always important, especially when you make, as you say, uh, as you say, exclusive statements. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't mean to scare you off. I just, you're very articulate. So that's why we want you as Benedetta here, but um, it's also very exciting. You uh, as a leader inside the institution, what it, what it suggests about the direction that NATO is taking. And, you know, as a former defense person myself, I, I think it's defense institutions have a very important role to play in characterizing the risk, even if they're not the ones that actually carry that policy burden. It may be that it's more in civilian agencies. Um, now, Catherine, you've already, the UN's already been invoked. It's, you know, weathering risk as, um, is a, a decision support tool that, that you will be testing. But could you just tell us, it does, and, and I know that you all have so much going on, and I apologize for artificially driving the conversation in certain directions, and we're going to get to some of those other things. But do you has has the UN through the mini mechanism or in UNEP or in the development areas, have you adopted any specific risk analysis or risk characterization tools to help the focus the UN efforts? Yes, thank, thanks so much, Sharon. And I feel like um, as other um, panelists have put their disclaimer in, I, perhaps I should also put one in um, here as well and, and just stress again that we are kind of um, Building the plane as we are of flying it, so to speak. Um, I think I think the point that um, Bernadette made now about um, false trade-offs, I think, is is a, a very timely point as well. Um, and and from our side, in terms of analysis, you know, it's really about getting to uh, the climate proofing or climate risk informing of uh, prevention and peace building efforts, um, working in the opposite direction, ensuring that um, climate change adaptation mitigation. Um, but beyond that, our work in kind of nature and environment. Uh, not only does no harm and is conflict sensitive, but is, is peace positive. And absolutely, I think from our side as well, we also see um, opportunities um, for win-win uh, appro approaches here. And I think um, that kind of brings us back to the point that you mentioned at the very beginning, um, Sharon, about the, the, you know, the kind of so what question. And here, in, in terms of um, kind of what analysis, analysis of what and for whom, um, I think a lot of our uh, analysis and assessment, perhaps from the kind of climate change um, part of the house has, has very much focused on uh, socioeconomic development, environmental de de degradation and disaster risk reduction. And, and we know that through these mechanisms, climate change ha uh, has impacts on peace, stability and security, but our assessments don't get to, get to that. And I think that, um, and, and also um, analysis and assessments working in that the other direction, the, the, the same as well. And I think that also kind of explains to a certain extent, the rationale for the uh, creation of the climate security um, mechanism back in 2018 to try to 
assess and address the um, intersectional risks um, that we see in, uh, um, in the shape and form of the climate, climate security nexus. Um, so you, it's, it's UNDP working together with DPPA and UNEP and more than 20 other UN entities through our community of, of practice. And um, we were tasked back in 2018 by the Secretary General's Executive Committee to develop a conceptual approach and, and toolbox um, so to, again, get to the, these, these kind of missing pieces to get to the uh, to, to, to get to so-called climate-related security risks. So we worked together with more than twenty partners, um, including Florian and Janani. Um, uh, it was, I think excellent talk of Adelphi and, and Cypri and, and academia and um, other actors who have um, very substantive offers in, in this space um, as well. And so we developed not only a conceptual approach but also country and regional case studies. Um, a briefing note, a checklist of questions and, and data sources, and a lot of this is still being rolled out as part of our field work. Um, it's being data, uh, beta, beta tested, and I think um, you know the, we, we stress here, as, as uh, colleagues have already, the importance of analysis. But we understand that you know the analysis alone is, is not only enough. We want to stress the process at the same time as, as well the engagement of stakeholders um, and ownership, and that um, timing is somehow key as, as, as well here in terms of planning cycles and being able to inform a critical decision. Uh, making processes um, and that there is often a, a lead process and uh, process here as well as uh, sensitization is needed. Um, I think as a field actor we would also stress um, a practice orientation you know an analysis may tell us what the problem is but practice is also important to telling us to what the solution might be and iteration um, an iterative process the feedback loop um, analysis will be practice but practice also form, forming and feeding back into um, the analysis is also key. Thank you, Catherine. That's great. And uh, as I say, the, what you're, it was very helpful to get the description of the climate security mechanism too. So for, for people who may not be familiar with that, it's a coordinating body within the UN as Catherine described it. So it plays a very important role. Now we're gonna move on um, next to hear from uh, Louise and Florian about who's actually doing climate security. <laughs> What's, you know, what are the best practices look like? And then we'll finish up with a discussion about actual field work um, where we'll have Elliot and others jump in to say, what's the field work actually look like and how's it being informed? But I wanted to, but before we go to Louise and Florian to talk about who's actually doing this and what are best practices look like, does anybody else have assessment tools or risk assessment um, uh, methodologies that they wanna put on the table? I know Elliot, you're going to uh, later, but uh, so you can save it for your, your portion, but. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add in here or questions for each other about risk assessment? Okay. Um, I will say for DOD, this is really, really important. And I think Catherine's point about sequencing matters as well. So they're right now doing the heavy lift on the fiscal year 2023 budget and, and sort of the, um, the plan and guidance that will go into that. So, you know, for them, the question about risk analysis is material right now. So that's, again, part of the reason I have a sense of urgency about this conversation. Um, Louise, I wanna to turn to you now for the best practices conversation. You just came out with a really great report on this very subject that was really interesting in its breadth. Could you just share with us a little bit about your report? Yes, that would be my pleasure, uh, Sharon. Actually, we consider this a great opportunity to talk about our, our, our best practices work, or we don't even dare to call it best practices, because the problem in this field of climate security practices is that there is so little activity going on on the ground, and we know so little of these practices that it's so difficult to justify if they're good or not good. And in a way, you could say, oh, that's a problem, but you could also argue it shows a bit, yeah, sometimes how difficult it can be, but it's also kind of inherent to peace and, and, and security and, and work. Uh, so how do you prove that you have prevented the conflict or that you contributed to peace and stability? And that's why I think also that this, this field, climate security practices, should not be judged from a climate finance perspective. You know, how many people have you safeguarded from flood risk or how many climate smart agricultural uh, hectares have you have you improved or uh, how many trees did you plant? But, but you should kind of make plausible assumption of how this in the longer term helps to uh, stop people from joining a terrorist uh, group or uh, uh, um, uh, 
uh, to move to regions where tensions are more are, are already mounting or um, uh, how uh, the distribution of natural resources is affected by climate change and by definition then also the tensions that are already existing between herders and farmers so I think there are actors that realize this. There are also actors that are active in the space behind the scenes. Eh? Inclusion of these discussions on natural resource distribution uh, in uh, mediation and dialogues. Uh, we also see uh, more actors coming from the conflict uh, prevention and peace building space, such as mercy groups, but also uh, uh, think tanks like International Crisis Group, uh, DCAF, uh, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. So we see a lot of, uh, let's say, new actors entering this space, people seeing the need. But it's still challenging for a policymaker like you, Daniel, or in, in DFID or in, 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 the, in the government of Denmark that are seeing the relevance of this agenda. But how do you justify to your conflict and, 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 and security colleagues that a climate security intervention is worth it compared to, I don't know, collecting weapons, uh, supporting rule of law uh, and, and other, uh, let's say, typically uh, typical interventions in this space. So this is something we we try to do we try to collect eh? we have on our website a whole overview of uh, climate security practices we're looking for more we also try to showcase each week a climate security practice so that it becomes more uh, tangible for people uh, and we have also uh, included a chapter in the forthcoming world climate security report of imccs on, on climate security practices to, to point out indeed this role of the military in, in maybe creating a safe operating space or maybe addressing hard security actors in the in the other uh, uh, countries you know to stop protecting illegal logging or making an own business out of it uh, so uh, we try to look at the, the practice from the uh, diplomacy, defense and uh, development perspective and um, yeah, to see if we can reflect on that and, 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 and what we can learn from that. So to eventually, let's say, justify also the scaling up of these, um, so these efforts. I'll, I'll stop here and I'm sure that we'll um, uh, come back to some more uh, operational points uh, later on. Or maybe you had yeah. a specific question, Sharon. Uh, well, uh, one thing one thing about your report that I found fascinating was the variety of of actors that you profiled. You know that it, it was really interesting that it was you know the French military, but it, and then it was Malian, um, I believe, development organizations. Can you just give us a sense of why you chose such a variety of actors to profile? Well, also because we noticed in the work that we did in the past years in the Planetary Security Initiative, there's, there are similarities, for instance, to the work of the Red Cross in humanitarian camps and having a military mission abroad. But these fields don't automatically talk to each other. They're not aligned. And of course, we can write in think tank reports that they should be more joined up, aligned, coordinated, it should be more coherent. Uh, but it's better to showcase, let's say, what these actors are doing and then that people can see for themselves what they can learn from it what they can take from it for instance uh how not to have uh, water tanks arriving at the humanitarian refugee camps for 10 years uh, similarly to a military mission or um yeah um so so that's just you know to point out that there is this variety in this this different range of actors and it's also not something only for the development space uh, to act in this in this and that it can also be done by local actors grassroots ngos uh, philanthropic organizations that very often support very good initiatives such as eco peace middle east or um, even um, the energy for peace partners that have a kind of credit system uh, to support renewables uh, uh, in the humanitarian field. Um, so also to point out that there's different ways of doing that uh, and not only the traditional big multi-million projects. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Louise. That's great. Um, I'd, I'd like to turn to Florian at this point. Um, and Florian's been helpfully uh, posting links if, uh, if y'all aren't following it to some of the work they've been doing, which is extremely valuable. Can you talk to us a little bit about best practices in the state of this field and what you see? 
Yeah, no, thank you so much for the opportunity and, and for, for setting up this excellent event. It's really a pleasure to be here and see uh, the, the interesting work going on and, and honestly how far we have come in, in, in um, the last couple of years. Um, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, two of our recent reports, and I'll, I'll share them in the chat so you can later later look them up uh, in more detail, which um, look specifically at, at peace operations or peace building uh, operations in Somalia and in in Mali, uh, and we'll follow that up with with a few others in the coming years. Um, which is driven by the interest of better understanding essentially how climate related security risks are impacting the mandate of these missions, right? Not, not what is it doing in the country, but actually what does it mean for the mission very explicitly in terms of its mandate um, and how are the missions responding? Um, and what this research and I think the, the collective research increasingly shows, and you will have heard me say that before, is that the human security risks of today, and we realize they are increasingly becoming hard security risks of tomorrow, but the solution is not laying within the military, right? Especially in these contexts where, where it, it is a human security space um, um, that we need to work with and it's, it's development issues and, and uh, around vulnerabilities. Um, I think one thing that drives at home very, very much for me um, was um, uh, putting putting that into a number um, why peace building and peace operations need to take this thing on, um, and and looking specifically now in the in the renewed data on on um, UN led peace operations, both special political missions and peacekeeping operations, we see that six out of the ten biggest peace operations are located in countries highly exposed to climate change. Um, it is an issue for peace operations. You cannot ignore it. It needs to be on the agenda for these operations and it needs to be on the agenda of the Security Council, which is sending these operations. Um, and what we show in our research was really fascinated me. I didn't ex I expect that we would find something uh, at the beginning, but I didn't expect we would find impacts across the mandate of all the missions um, that we've looked at, right? From the hard security side, DDR programming, uh, recruitment efforts, um, to operational uh, mobility, uh, combat readiness of, of, the, of the peacekeeping troops, right? Um, over governance issues in relation to legitimacy, local power sharing agreements, to the development space, um, uh, increased risk of sexual and gender-based violence and, and, and um, um, the development losses um, uh, related with, with, with climate impacts, we see impacts across the mandate of peace operations. So what that shows us is on the one hand, the security landscape is changing, right? That's why a military response in itself is not the adequate way anymore. Um, the security challenges are different. And also what it tells us is that it is changing what it takes to build peace. And what I find really fascinating, and to bring that to the, to the question on, on best practices and what is happening, this is something that's realized in the field, in peace operations, that is re recognized in UN headquarters, Department of Peace Operations, Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and uh, credit where credit is due, that is much due to the work that, that Catherine and colleagues in the climate security mechanism have led over the last couple of years. We have come, you, I mean, the CSM has achieved in the, the few years it exists already what it was set out to do, raising the awareness of these issues and providing this information. That means now when we talk with missions, we see SRSGs, DSRSGs, uh, senior leadership talking about climate security issues in a very informed manner. We see senior leadership in New York in the Department of Peace Operations that tends not to talk about climate in, in more esoteric sense, um, but focuses typically on more hard security issues, starting to talk about emission reductions and, and, and questions that, that a couple of years ago, you would be like, that's impossible. Um, Importantly, a few things we see on the ground. We see, for example, in Somalia, um, the, the common country assessment, uh, an assessment that sets out what the, what the situation is and how the UN should operate across all its agencies, um, highly put and putting climate security highly in there. So it's really important to see that it is recognized and it is starting to guide interventions. Um, the placement of an environmental security advisor in Somalia uh, within the mission really crucial, one person doing 
20 different things, right? It's, it's a horrible, like I love Chris, but it's a horrible job, right? Because you have so much to do, there's so much need. Um, but the impact it has on increasing already now coordination, training political mediation efforts um, um, in, in climate security, bringing these discussions on, informing the SRSG to better report to the Security Council on these issues and thereby completing the circle that we get um, also so better responses from, from headquarters is really important. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I think that is the, the, the really excellent examples. We see that also in a more implicit way, especially in Mali. Mali doesn't have an environmental security advisor yet, um, but we see that despite people saying we don't really do climate security, once you talk to them and once they get a better understanding what climate security actually is, they're like, well, you're actually doing it, right? There's a lot of implicit responses that are happening on the ground that are really worth looking into and seeing because um, as it is changing the security landscape, obviously people working in the security landscape get aware of it, right? And, and find start to find different ways and different solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Florian, that was great. And I think that concept of implicit responses that are already happening is great and um, and, and also uh, calling out the, the success of the climate security mechanism is great too, because um, as, as we all know, and as Catherine is living, um, it's, it's a very, very small number of people um, that are trying to coordinate across a very, very big organization. And I think having you call it out as successful is, is really helpful because I think um, other agencies that may be listening have a similar challenge, which is they have very little capacity to take on this issue, but you can do a lot even with a little. Um, I'm gonna jump right to the, the, the next uh, area of discussion and then let's get in some crosstalk. Because for example, Louise brought up something that I would like to come back to um, at the end, which is the idea of, of success metrics basically and, and how do you measure whether you're doing it right or wrong. Um, Elliot Levine, let me turn to you at this point, because so Mercy Corps, of course, is a big global humanitarian and development and peace building um, conflict prevention organization that does everything from the policy and the analysis type work to the field work. Um, and you have been taking on climate security and your colleague Emma Whitaker as, as a, a, a not just something to think about or analyze, but something to do. Can you talk to us about what Mercy Corps is trying to do and how you're trying to do it? And I'm gonna be off screen for just a second, but I'm listening to you. So don't be distracted by that. Um, I think it'd be very interesting for everyone here um, because you also did a landscape review of what was going on, what, what you have to tell us about, what are you actually doing when it comes to climate security? Yeah, th thanks, Sharon, and really appreciate getting the opportunity to be part of this conversation and frankly be part of it with, with all the other colleagues here. I mean, everyone here are, are representing organizations and efforts that we have benefited from and learned so much from over the past couple of years. So this is just a, a great opportunity. Um, so Sharon, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, um, I'm coming from, from Mercy Corps, you know, a, a really large humanitarian and development organization, roughly like 5,000 employees at any one time around the world um, in various countries in which we're operating. So as you said, yeah, we, we come to this, we come to the climate security discussion from the from really the perspective of, of program implementation and what does that program implementation gonna look like? Um, I, I think it's helpful to figure out where we where we started with this. Um, our our own journey as an organization really started with our work on with our work on resilience and our our way of trying to integrate various types of of environment, social, and economic shocks into the programs that we were developing and implementing on the ground. To take a more concerted effort at that. Um, after a number of years of that global initiative for us, we took a look back at our work, and what we realized is. Um, while we had anticipated a wide variety and range of different types of shocks and stresses, really they boiled down to two buckets, climate related shocks and conflict related shocks of which of course are highly um, integrated and in responding to, to one another. You know, on one hand, we, we saw the effects of climate change creating you know, a number of direct as well as indirect stresses that fueled conflict in the places we were working. And then on the other side, we were seeing that conflict and insecurity really precluding much of the needed work in adaptation 
um, that we were trying to move forward. So it's really creating barriers to the types of climate change adaptation work um, that we were trying to pursue um, yeah, with communities. So really that, that acknowledgement sparked a, a range of different activities, including stock taking of our own programs, um, which led to our first approach to climate security and the elevate, importantly for us, the elevation of climate security to our agency's primary strategy mechanism, our, our global compass, which sort of points the direction of where we're going and what we see as strategic, um, strategic efforts for us. And so since then, um, since that point, I, I would say that our work comes down into sort of two buckets of, of different work. Um, the first is, and those are learning and, and then doing, of which of course are uh, in, um, very much interrelated in, in our world. From the learning part, you know, it, it really was, it, uh, our, our work in this front was really the acknowledgement that although we had some existing programs that address climate security dynamics, we didn't really have the tools or the knowledge to achieve the impact we wanted. And when we took a quick scan looking at what others were doing, we didn't necessarily see that others had them either. And we started to realize that we were working within an ecosystem that felt very new and, and very young, despite this being a, a highly researched and very much not new subject, uh, subject area for some time. Um, so we started to work on building evidence on what works. We started to develop qualitative case studies of our work in places like Ethiopia and Uganda, in particular looking at our work on environmental peace building approaches um, through uh, sort of long US four year or more USAID funded programs. Um, we were asked by FCDO at one point to do a landscape assessment of various climate security strategies being Im implemented by uh, other development and humanitarian agencies. Um, and then as, as you know well, Sharon, um, with funding from New America, we, we also did, a um, as a follow-up to that, we did a landscape assessment of the um, of other types of, of institutions like ours, looking at the types of climate security risk assessment tools that they were that they were using, um, and and either using or, or adapting. So we've been focusing a lot on learning, but we've also been focusing a lot on on doing. Um, and we have a range of programs right now, which I guess I'll just since I only have the three minute mark, uh, which um, I may have already gone over. I'll just no, point feel to free. Two. It's okay. I'll keep going. It's all right. All right we're cool. we're gonna get into a free for all now, so you can keep going. <laughs> Sounds good, Sharon. Um, so I'll point out two for now. Um, the the first is in Mali. It's a USAID funded program called Benibara, um, and it's really working to address uh, livelihood insecurities brought on in part by increasing resource scarcity. And that's really a the livelihood insecurity is a, a sort of pathway is one of which we're seeing. Um, as a primary one that we're needing to address as an agency and that leads to uh, climate security risks. Um, uh, so building on the capacity of, um, so we do that in a number of ways. Um, we're building on the capacity, uh, we're building the capacity of institutions and communities to identify, to both identify, but also respond to climate related, to conflict related risks through different types of early warning, early response actions. Um, we're promoting climate smart agriculture and fodder systems really to, in that case, to reduce the reliance on natural resource related inputs of which we know puts these communities at even higher risk. And we're promoting, importantly here, we're trying to, as best we can, to promote off farm livelihoods, which are also less dependent on livelihood, uh, less dependent on, on natural resources. Um, while at the same time, trying our best to address what we would consider to be the underlying causes of instability in the region, things related to governance um, and particularly strengthening laws around land and land ownership and management. Um, and in DRC, another program, um, we're, we're focused on um, really looking at a combination of approaches which starts by strengthening ecosystem services um, to both promote agricultural productivity but also risk reduction. Um, while uh, in like in the the example I mentioned earlier, um, a focus on climate smart agriculture and and working on um, land security issues. Interestingly, in, in DRC, one of the things I think that is, is worth highlighting is that we're really trying to pilot approaches to incentivize community members to really look at the risks that they have now, but also take into account the risks they, they could incur in the future as a result of climate change, as well as a variety of other shocks, and to put in place risk reduction strategies now, which may not pay off for 
for a number of years. Um, this is something that we've been wanting to prioritize a lot more and we're excited that we're, we're doing with these programs. Um, I would just say for, for these two programs that I highlighted and for others, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to develop approaches which we would say for shorthand are striving for a systems approach in which we mean really that they're sort of integrated multi-sector, multi-scale strategies. Um, and so these, these two represent some of that. I mean, I, I, I won't go into this, but I would say that what's guiding our, our future work are sort of three principles that have kind of, or three lessons learned that have kind of come out of both our research as well as our programming. And the first is, and, and these speak to what others have said already, is that we really do feel that there's a need within, within agencies like ours to sort of broaden and deepen the evidence base for strategies um, that are addressing climate security risks, and in short, to really learn what's working. Um, while at the same time, broaden our programmatic approaches, um, it may be that in other sort of with other institutions outside of um, sort of the NGO community, the, the approaches may be a bit broader. But what we found when doing the FCDO landscape study is that the approaches felt very narrow, very regulated to immediate environmental or natural resource management related interventions of which really didn't, um, which we felt sort of narrowed the overall approaches. And then the third is that we really wanted to start sort of breaking down what we saw barriers to action in, in our field, um, primarily through the development of assessment tools specifically meant at um, implementers like, like ours. So I'll leave it there and can go into any more of the details in the free for all that you just mentioned we're about to dump into. <laughs> well, and I wanna ask you a pretty pointed question, which, uh, you know, fair warning, that's this is a question for everyone and particularly probably for Benedetta and mm -hmm. Catherine, but, Okay, that all sounded really good, but but what do you actually do? I mean, do you like do you Elliot fly to Ethiopia oh. and go to your country team that's doing agriculture and say, "Here, this is climate smart agriculture. Um, this is here's a tool. If you tap Control X, it will show you everything." Or is it, or as you say, "Let's sit down and talk about this. I'm going to tell you what you should be doing differently." How do you actually do this? I mean, you're, you're asking me about a fundamental of my job. <laughs> so I'm- I, Well, maybe I'm not you. I mean, who do you yeah. task to go out and actually like, how do you actually do it? Yeah, no, it, it's a good question. Um, so for context, I'm part of a global team of technical support to all of our, our country and program teams. Um, so this question really does kind of get at the heart of the way we operate, regardless if it's climate security or not. But I think particular with this work, this is not something where we're going where we're going to see the types of change that we need to see in the way that our it, the way that Mercy Corps and our peers will operate by having just some sort of off the shelf assessment tool. Um, it's not going to be through the development of some specific um, computer model or, or whatever it's going to be. It, it's going to be a process of of ongoing capacity building and analysis together. And I, I say that just because of like. You know, I, I mentioned our global resilience initiative before, and if it was easy enough to just publish a bunch of guidelines and say, here, read this, that, that would have been great. But instead, we spent 10 years not only building out our own definitions and our own, our own approaches, but really working with each country team individually through trainings and workshops and then co-developing programs together um, in a way that really builds understanding. Um, so this is going to be this will sometime require me to get on a plane and work with, or, or Emma, my colleague as well, to get on a plane and work directly, directly with country teams. And other times it might be remote webinars and trainings. Um, Emma and I are also increasingly focused on developing guidance. Um, like I mentioned, sort of narrative case studies and everything so that program teams can understand how various elements of what they're already be, what they're already doing, frankly, can be combined to really explicitly address climate security risks. And are you using um, subnational climate projections for, for that? Like, do you have the data that you need or is that still a work in progress? We don't always have all the data that we need. Um, to be frank about that, we, we do pull in, we do think it's fundamental that we're pulling in whatever climate data is available to us um, it, for that location. Um, that is not a practice that we've, we've actually seen as robust in, in other actors is that we, we'd like. Um, 
but for us, I mean, for us, it's it's incredibly important. It's the sort of cornerstone, whether, whether we're looking at actions to address risks right now and understanding if those are actually being driven by climate change or if there's something else, um, as well as thinking about how our programs are, are addressing future risks or, or not in some cases. Now, we have, uh, we have some kind of hot questions in the chat that I want to bring in, but uh, two things. One is, um, I just wanted to one follow up question for, for Benedetta and then also to open the floor. Y'all should feel free. You can either wave your hands and signal or just jump in. Um, Benedetta, just the same question. I know that you're early days and that you haven't actually launched your, it's coming in June, the actual plan or strategy. But, but do you have a sense of how NATO is actually going to do this? Like how, how it's going to get integrated into your operations or, you know, the way that you're actually conducting uh, alliance operations? Sure. And, and just to be clear, now we are, in a way, we are, we are building on, on a series of things that we're already doing uh, in the sense that we're not starting from scratch at all. Uh, and that's a point one of the previous speakers made that sometime now there is an enhanced awareness of what we're doing and looking at through a climate lens and a climate change lens, which is something that it's uh, for the Alliance itself, it's something relatively new, but it builds on a lot of work that really pre-existed. For example, we'll be working for decades on uh, improving our energy efficiency, on reducing dependency on fossil fuels, on working on green tech. And we have since 2014, a framework for green technologies. So there is a lot that is already happening uh, that we're going to capitalize on the difference that we're pulling it all together, uh, looking at it through the lens of climate change and building political momentum to really uh, make this a political priority. So just to, just, to, but you're absolutely right that we are definitely scaling up. Um, I mean, essentially, there's not so many ways to go about it. Huh? I think, uh, my personal view, uh, when you want to affect, and when, and this is a personal view, but when you, you're trying to, what we are trying to do, if you do this well, is affect change at all scale in a massive organization that, of course, uh, in general, the defense in the defense sector tends to be uh, quite set in its ways. I think that's something we can say and would apply to many of our uh, different societies and countries. So how do you affect a change uh, of that in your way systemic level nature? And I think you need a few different things. You need to have um, some some accountability and a focal point and someone uh, or some, or a bureau or an office or whatever you want to call it for whose uh, for whose climate change and security is a priority and who will hold everybody else accountable. But if you all, but if you only have that, you risk then climate change becoming a nice uh, add on that you slap on your policy once it's developed. And I don't think we want to go that way. So I think you need that. Plus, you also have to have advisors, experts really working embedded in the different parts of your of your government system. I, I'm being quite vague, but I think more or less uh, you need this combination of a political accountability, high level, high level momentum and some type of a clear agenda that you're working towards, but then you also need to have a uh, real mainstreaming if you wish, it's a word that I hate, but I think it expresses that you need to have people who know what they're doing in every, in every part of the organization. And if you can't have that, because of course budgets are tight, then you might have need some roving experts or someone who steps in and out. And, and then it has to be a dialogue. Uh, I think for, for one thing that I think we can learn, speaking from a NATO perspective, I think we can learn a lot from the way we have approached uh, the Women, Peace and Security agenda and how we have actually made it uh, not as opposed to an add-on, an integrated part of how we do our operational planning. So uh, that gender considerations are not addressed at the very end of the operational planning, but they are addressed when we actually sit down and think about the mission, the operational design, the, the, the objectives we want to achieve, and then later, and then later on that same advisor that has been there for example that's why the way we developed the nato mission in iraq with the gender advisors in better from day one uh, and i think that's a good recipe if you want this not to be just an afterthought then you have to give a, to give a, the person who represents the agenda or the agenda itself a seat at the table early on so that when you set objectives define criteria think about how to monitor you 
feature it in. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of creative ways to do it. So I don't want to say it's very simple. It's not at all. But at the end of the day, I think we know what the what we know that some elements of success need to be there. Uh, and then just to close, because I don't want to, I know there's a lot of uh, um, everybody else that probably has smarter things to say than me on this one, but I would just wanted to really echo the importance of the um, of trading and education and making this something that uh, that is uh, becomes important, not just at the high political leadership level, but also in your middle management and in your office there, because otherwise you can design really great policies, but if those uh, that are especially at the middle management level are not convinced, uh, you're going to run into some serious resistance and that's where the machine can strike back and really slow you down. So it's worth, I think, taking the time and really invest also in building the uh, climate IQ of your organization. And uh, we're certainly working on that quite, uh, quite hard here at NATO. And I think uh, it's also easier to do because all of the work uh, many of the panelists in this, if not all of the panelists on this have been doing for years actually helping us change the discourse uh, to, uh, to, to, to being in the stage we are now, where the idea that climate change is absolutely essential to secure, is an important consideration when you think about security is no longer contested. So then we can do a lot building on, uh, on the policy and advocacy work that has been done for, by many for many years. I'd like to in invite everyone to jump in, but one thing I wanna say, um, I think that was great climate IQ and also that in my experience, you do need champions at the top, in the middle, and ground up within especially very large organizations in act for something to actually move. So uh, I think that's an important piece of it for sure, from my experience. Um, and and I'm, I'm just going to point out that Florian said some really similar things to what you said as far as the way that these things are working. And Janani, you've been silent for a long time, so get ready to say something. Um, Eve Namakula is feeding really interesting questions into our sidebar, and, uh, and I, I wanted to address one of them really quickly. And then also Rich Roberts has uh, fielded a question that I want you all to be ready to jump in on about the three Ds, you know, di diplomacy, defense, and development, and how you actually make them work together, and what the role is for that. And I know you've all done thinking on that, so I think that would be great to hear people talk about But Eve, I wanted to respond directly to your question about that we all sound like we're talking about the global south in a sort of vaguely neoliberal colonial way. Um, and I I wouldn't, I mean, I hope that that's not the message that's come across because what you're actually seeing is people who are working really hard to, to help build climate security and resilience in these places because it's where there's a big need. However, I think everyone represented here, whether it's an institution or a, or a country, we all believe that climate security starts in our own nations and, and that our own policies about decarbonization, about cutting greenhouse gas emissions, about building resilience for our own populations, that's where climate security starts. And we can't be effective at promoting climate security in the world if we aren't doing what we must at home. So just a, an observation to that question. But as for the three Ds, and, and Eve has asked a couple of other really interesting questions, um, and, I, and I'm really glad to see panelists responding as well. Um, but on the three Ds, does anybody want to jump in about, you know, the evolution of that and where you see that going? Yeah, John Ani, please. Thanks, Sharon, and thanks, Rich, for the for the great comment. Um, yeah, I, I touch on this and also just um, underscore something Benedetta said, I, I think her analogy with like how this process with climate security needs to go the same way as gender and and her analogy with the women peace and security movement um is is very much um in line with yeah how, how i think this needs to go as well i think this approach of needing both this kind of specialized advisors embedded in the short term um as well as increasing knowledge and understanding and buy-in across um uh, across all departments in the long term. And I think this really connects to this 3D approach because there is a lot of knowledge about different pieces of the puzzle. And it is a puzzle because we don't, it, it is so complex and multidimensional um, the, that we do need to bring all the Ds plus the other parts as well um, to the table to, to really get the, the big bigger picture. Um, I think the, th the point I wanted to make is that 
there is there are processes i think um some of you were involved in a, a dialogue process uh called climate security in 3d which brought together uh different actors from the 3ds across different uh geographic areas and i i, I it was a very uh, useful process it was also really uh important to to see that there there is knowledge so from the US perspective, I think it's 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 maybe useful to hear that you don't need to go it alone. There's a lot of knowledge that's already been built up that, and you, you can piggyback on. Um, so there's a real value in not just connecting across your 3Ds, but also building on um, building this community of practice, which is essentially why you've you've kind of convened the space, Sharon, to to bring together those different actors across the, the, the different Ds, but also across the different um, countries to really make sure that we can connect the dots and really build on a lot of what's out there. I mentioned that there's a lot of really good climate uh, security risk analysis. There's really great um, uh, risk assessments. Florian has shared, shared work. There's lots of um, stuff that's been shared in the chat. So I think uh, it's not starting from nothing. Um, and I think there's a really, really important value in in kind of codifying this community of practice in some way. So it, we don't keep having these conversations, but starting from uh, a lower baseline, we can really keep building up on it um, on this baseline and, and moving forward. Florian, you're kind of leaning forward, like you have something to say. Are you just leaning forward, or do you have something to say? No, I have a lot to say. <laughs> Thank you so I much. Bet. I think. Uh, um, uh, just a few points that I wanted to raise, and I'm trying to think which one I'm playing off now first. Um, now let's go to the colonial um, uh, question, which I think is really important because a lot of the discourse and 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 work that is done is done in in the north, right? And we were very fortunate um, to work closely together with with an organization in Kenya, bringing together um, local civil society and local experts to not tell our story of climate security, but hear their story of climate security and actually learn from that perspective and, and then use our voice that is a little bit louder than probably as, as this type of organizations um, to amplify that, right? And, and showcase this different version. Um, and what we're trying very closely to do, for example, is a project with Nupi that we're working on is consultations, but consultations on a fair basis. It's not an extraction, it is to understand that my policy recommendations that I'm giving you make sense for your context. I can tell you a lot of things that make absolutely no sense for you, but for me to understand local governments, local civil societies, where they are, where to pick them, um, uh, what, what would help in these contexts is really important. And, and in the project with uh, Environmental of Peace that we are, we are working on a big report, uh, looking broadly at the environmental security space and, and, and peace and just transitions, we're also looking closely at, at environmental defenders, right? Uh, one, one of these local, local actors that is really crucial and really important. Um, um, and there's actually also a security uh, factor in there. Just Janani mentioned we shouldn't invent uh, new things, right, and, 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 and keep things alive. And also Elliot was mentioning the, the assessment and, and talking to a US audience and having Daniel here with the US aid link. I'm like, why, I mean, probably it's political reasons, but why the heck did we stop the, the work that Ashley Morgan and, and colleagues were, were leading on, on the excellent work on the intersection of fragility and climate risks, right? A really useful full tool. One of the smartest things I've seen out there um, that actually understood what it was doing. It understood the climate side and it understood the fragility side. Typically you get one or the other, um, you seldomly get both together. Um, put some money back in that, that is there, the concept is great, the people are, are still alive and around, right? So this is a thing we, we sh that would be a very easy win to pick up and allow me then to refer to that work, not from 2014, but have an updated version from 2021, right? I think that would be really useful for, for this space. That's great. And Daniel, I, I hope you wrote that down. Um, Catherine and then Louise, I wanna, we're almost out of time, so Catherine, uh, let's get to you and then Louise, I'd like to hear a last comment from you. Yeah, Go ahead, Catherine. Th thanks so much. Thanks so much, Sharon. And um, I think to the point that you made just now about um, how we can better work with and empower um, actors from the, the global south, I think the, you know, the, the rationale for the creation for the me mechanism, um, I think somehow it's a template for that. Um, we have, um, through, through our work over the last two years, um, 
in trying to embed uh, climate security experts and advise, advisors within different partner entities. So this includes um, the Tapal Gorm Authority, um, also the League of Arab States, um, and then um, uh, special political missions and peace operations. But through this, through this means, we have um, a mechanism to support partners, right? So they develop and grow their and um, develop their own strategies to address climate related security risks. So it's not an agenda imposed by us, it's one that's kind of developed by them with our support, kind of reflecting their own institutional priorities and, and their, own, their own capacities and so forth. And I think um, that that's really important as well. And, and um, when we're talking about uh, capacity gaps, I think we are talking about, about gaps um, in uh, at every level, as, as, as colleagues mentioned just now, from senior to kind of intermediate to junior level and, 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 and so forth. And we are still a small community. So there's somehow a need as well to kind of grow this community together as well and, and networks and partnerships and, and working with those who are already there and helping them kind of divide, define their own inter, uh, institutional priorities for addressing climate related security risks, I think um, would be key to think about. Thanks, Catherine. And I know you're playing a really important role in growing that community. So appreciate getting that comment from you. Louise. Yeah, I, I was thinking maybe to say something positive to end off. Um, um, uh, let's hope that we grow this uh, this field of climate security practices, that more will be implemented on the ground, that USAID is also chipping in, other actors are entering the field. It doesn't need to be only development cooperation projects, it can also be different types of uh, mediation, diplomacy, and also perhaps realize that in some cases it can also be a new entry point for peace building. So climate change is a kind of relatively still new enemy that affects many, many actors and can also be used as a kind of entry point to bring these actors around the table and talk, let them talk to each other, maybe not about ethnic divides or historic uh, conflict reasons or other nasty business. Um, um, uh, so let's see if we can also use it, let's say, if, uh, as a source of inspiration for new uh, peace building efforts. Uh, uh, I leave it at that, and I hope that that's uh, also a helpful contribution. Thank you, Louise. I mean, I think all of your work that you're doing is a really important contribution um, to building a baseline that both at Clingondale and through the Planetary Security Initiative, you guys have been building the, the foundation for all of this. So I really appreciate your comments. Hey, Daniel. Any last thoughts? I mean, I'll just say one thing as a former US government employee, um, one of the problems for us with the 3D, uh, which is we're not, it's not unique to the United States, but it's certainly a factor for us, is that we have one D that swamps the other Ds. And that becomes a, a you know, a practical problem that we have one D that is vastly more resourced with people and money than the others. That becomes a practical challenge. But uh, Daniel, you don't have to comment on that particular <laughs> thing, but do you have any last thoughts, any, any uh, inspirations that you want to leave us with or to-do lists that you have uh, formed for yourself? Yeah, you've all left me with definitely a growing to-do list, which I appreciate very much. Um, I think I, I, just a quick comment on the, on the 3Ds is that it's somewhat informal, but you know, I think we know who is working on this issue and there's definitely appreciation and, con and consideration the extent that organizations with, with overlapping, albeit very different missions, can coordinate. I think we're, we're, we're certainly thinking about that uh, positive and serious way. Um, and I just also want to just express appreciation for, for everyone's comments and everyone's time. Uh, I took a lot away from this book as someone who's currently working in the US government, someone who had been an academic studying this issue. So. Uh, just want to thank everybody and, and thank you, Sharon, for putting it all together. You are welcome. You and I thank you to all of our panelists. This is quite an august group, and um, I hope everybody who's joined us realizes how lucky we are to have this group of people together. And um, as I said, we are planning to have some follow-on, much more focused conversations. Um, also, I know one of our, our uh, Mana Farouche mentioned that that was having trouble seeing the chat. We'll try to capture certainly all the links that you've shared on our event page um, so that that if anybody missed, because there's some very valuable links going up in the in the chat. So we'll try to get those all up on our event site. And um, thank you all. And any last shots? You've got a couple of minutes if anybody wants a, a final comment. Benedetta? Very, very quick. And it's, it's a point about the, um, and of course my phone is ringing. Right. <laughs> 
of course, right on cue. Uh, and it's a point about the balance between the three Ds and um, and just a point that I think it's incredibly important that that you have that with these conversations and in general in in a, I, I see at least this as a trend, uh, the the military and the defense sector per se is being brought into these conversations more and more. And I know that there's 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 trade offs there, and there's always a um, uh, perception that when you bring uh, the defense or military sector in, there is a risk that you're going to militarize or, or look at the, or securitize the solution to a problem. And that's certainly something that I don't think would benefit <laughs> addressing climate, climate security at large. And that's a point that has been made throughout the panel, but it doesn't have to be. And, uh, and I think Sherry Goodman is the one who, who said, uh, well, at least I heard it from her, this is more about, uh, climatizing uh, our defense sectors to really understanding uh, the impact on security rather than securitizing the climate conversation. So it's just just a nod to the fact that even if the conversations are not always natural between these different Ds, um, I think they're essential. They're absolutely essential when it comes to climate change and uh, and and. And the bringing the military in is really a good idea on these discussions, and it doesn't have to mean uh, changing the spectrum through which we address conflict, which needs to be continue continue to be driven by a integrated political uh, political approach. So just just that was a really important last point to make. I really appreciate it, and I completely agree that in the United States, not a question of militarizing climate change, but rather shifting what our definition of security is, um, because I think we've had too narrow a definition here for a long time. And we have entered a time, I think one of the questions in the chat was also about the effect of COVID on climate insecurity, and that's a whole nother event. But the point is taken, I think, that what makes us safe or unsafe or prosperous or not prosperous is, is more than just about an armed conflict. And we, we in this country need to do, I think, I think a better job of of secure of changing how we define security and how we get security more to the point. Um, okay, we are at time. I want to thank you all very much for the conversation and more importantly for the work that you're doing because you've all been the people that are advancing, creating what this area is and advancing it. So thank you very much for your time and for everyone who joined us today. Take care. <laughs>